and welcome to Monday Night Reading. Hi, everyone. It's a special night. Uh, Michelle Bajin is here for her book, Be Good With Money. I think that's a fantastic title. I have thought that for a long time. It's a promise title, in case you were wondering. Uh, Michelle's been working on this book for a while. Really put heart, soul, some tears, <laughs> lots of time into making this book really useful, transformational, helpful, a real game changer for readers and um, achieve that in my humble opinion. Monday Night Reading is an event that I started because I said, why the heck don't nonfiction authors get to have readings like fiction authors? That's silly. Let's make one. And Laura Stone uh, and Shade Amherd from my team who can wave can can confirm that if if there's something that I think we need, I will likely just make it. Uh, and so that's how Monday Night Reading came to be. Uh, what we do here is we uh, feature an author uh, and their book. We hear a couple readings that the author has chosen. We have some Q and A if we if 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 people are inspired to, but mostly it's me talking to Michelle and asking my own questions. If you have a question, you can for certainly jump in. And then uh, the big rule we have is this is a supportive feedback experience, and so therefore. We don't give any constructive criticism on Monday night reading, uh, we, but we do give an abundance of feedback, positive feedback in the chat. There's some regulars here who will lead the way, I'm sure, uh, for how we like to give that feedback. And we give the chat to the author, which is something they really love. They don't get to see it during Monday night reading. So please, if you wouldn't mind, just get in there and be effusive with what connects with you and all of your praise. I would also like to say that Monday night reading uh, is uh, we we feature authors who are in top three book workshop and also in the sprint group, which is where Michelle hails from. And uh, she wrote a good part of that book, if maybe almost all of it ish, a lot, a lot of the book in our sprint community. So welcome for that. Uh, let's see, what else did I really want to say? Make sure we get out of the way here. I think that's it. Just that we're so glad you're here and uh, in support of Michelle. Oh, I know what it is. Laura Stone will be periodically in the chat adding links so you can get your copy of Be Good With Money. And uh, I really encourage you to do that. It's it's helpful for authors when there's a little bump in sales and we can do that together today uh, if, if, if we all just get a copy. If you already have a copy, I hope you'll gift it to someone. I am positive you know at least one other person who might need to be good with money. And then I also hope that you will give leave a review. This is that second step of the buying process that most of us don't do. So I would this it's like gold, that's currency for an author. So if we can get you to leave a review, just a quick little reminder about reviews. Um, it can take just a couple minutes. You don't have to sound like a professional. You could just choose your favorite line from today. The cool thing is you're learning enough today that you could leave a review today. So at the end of Monday night reading, you have enough information to leave a review for Be Good With Money. All right. Okay. And with that note, I'm going to let Laura introduce Michelle. I would be thrilled to introduce my friend, Michelle. When Michelle was six, her father asked to borrow money from her piggy bank for a pack of smokes. And when she refused, he took it anyway. And thus began her complicated relationship with money, in particular, the shame and taboo that surrounds money problems and our inability to talk about them. And she understands the impact of living with inherited money beliefs and the emotional toll that that can follow in the wake of a dysfunctional relationship with money, rippling out to affect everyone in its path. But Michelle's here to teach us that the pattern can be broken. Those beliefs can be transcended. You can take ownership of your wealth and choose a life of financial freedom. And it starts with learning how to simply talk about money without shame or fear. And as a senior financial advisor, speaker and change maker, she brings wisdom and guts to these money conversations. While not the first to work her way through college, 
She did so against an absurd backdrop of family betrayal and financial secrets. Michelle is an Investopedia 100 top financial advisor and a TEDx speaker. It's a fantastic TEDx. And she successfully lobbied for K through 12 financial psychology education in her home state of New Jersey. And I'll put in the chat how you can stay connected with her. AJ? Yay, it's impressive, Michelle. <laughs> Um, welcome. It's a rite of passage to come to Monday night reading. We're so glad that you're here and that you made it. <laughs> I am. I don't know what I am right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm very, very excited. I've been to quite a few of your Monday night readings. So to be asked to join, um, is really an honor and it is a rite of passage to, uh, this is a very celebratory moment, especially with the audience. Thank you for everybody for coming tonight. AJ, for you asking. Laura, for your just Dallas Cowboy cheerleading always. Um, this book is what it is because of so many people in this audience and because of the um, sprint group over the last two and a half years or so. It's, it's a long road, right? It's good to have your peeps. Yes. yes, yes. We always believed in mm. you. One thing that I really want to point out is I'm about to ask you about your fundamentals. So you're ready for that? Mm. Okay. Right. Yeah. Book fundamentals, everybody. Um, these are the foundation <clears throat> for writing a nonfiction book. And I'm really a stickler about it. And Michelle kept working on it and working on it and working on it to try and get it right and kept think, saying, can I run that by you one more time? Can I run that by you one more time? <laughs> and it's just a true testament to her commitment to excellence. We don't have, and anybody can write a book. Anybody, you could all write one. We could all take the language that's in the chat today, put it in a Word doc, throw it up on Amazon tomorrow and call it a book. Um, Michelle is committed, committed to absolutely nailing this, not for herself, but for readers. So on that note, I want to hear where did, what you got. Who is your reader? Let's start there. Who, you, who did you write this book for? Uh, I wrote this book for people who want to be as successful with their money as they are in the rest of their lives. Oh, I love, I just love hearing that. That's so good. Okay. Core message. What is your core message for readers? Uh, my core message is it's not that talking about money is hard. It's talking about our feelings about money. That is hard. True. True. Okay. And what is your- I feel your like promise? I'm on a game show right now. <laughs> this is the last question like that. I promise. Uh, what is a promise to readers by the end of this book? What will they experience? Yep. Know, understand? Uh, they will be able to better navigate their financial plot twists Ooh. in order to realize their full financial potential. Oh man. Those are good. Those are really, really good. You'd made some changes since I last heard them, and those are good. Thank you. Um, so I wanted you to I wanted you to set up the excerpt, and then when you're done with the excerpt, um, well, I have a bunch of questions for you. Okay. So tell us we, we, from where are you going to read? What part of the book? Okay, so I'm going to start with um, part of chapter one, and then I'm going to actually jump to chapter eleven because. It gives uh, both sides of a story, kind of a beginning and a closure. Oh, okay. And I think it really hits on um, the core message of the book by doing it this way. Okay, love that. And then so you just you just pause when you're done and I'll know that I can jump in and ask you a bunch of stuff. Okay. Okay, here's Michelle, everybody. Chapter one, financial plot twist. Let me start by saying... I was crazy about my parents. Growing up, I saw mom and dad at their highest and best, living the American dream, building a business from the ground up, and capable of doing anything they could think of. They were energetic, fun, and downright charming, always gathering large groups of friends for epic parties. In the early days of their household moving and storage business, money was tight. Simply paying the rent, keeping food on the table, and making payments on the moving truck that was our sole source of income was a struggle. My father performed the work of a five-man crew all by himself for the first few years and fell into bed exhausted, only to get up and do it all the next day again. 
To make ends meet, my mom clipped coupons and traded SNH green stamps from the supermarket for necessities. My brother and I wore winter coats that were three sizes too large to, to avoid replacing them each year. Despite how tight money was, we had what we needed and we had each other. I always felt safe. I loved having conversations with my father about business. He taught me about portfolios and taxes and interest rates and the inner workings of how his company ran. He showed me how he tracked his sales closing ratios, calculated moving estimates and details about how he managed his crew. He talked about ethics and making hard choices. He had the epitome of a growth mindset. He followed his own passions, learned to fly, built cars from scratch, got into photography, got me into it, competed with my mom as an amateur ballroom dancer. I ate that stuff up. Mom was a fashionista. She taught me how to sew, how to dress, and that it's never too late to pursue a dream. My mother was introspective and deep and one of the most empathetic people I knew. She also was an incredible jazz dancer. Within a few years of being in business, my parents secured government work doing military moves, which paid well. However, the downside was that the government payments came in big lump sums, and often this would mean months of no income. Managing this well required planning and budgeting, which was most definitely not my parents' strong suit. Our erratic income aside, we moved into a home and my brother and I went to good schools. We started talking about me going to college. And although my dad would joke about my MRS degree, in truth, they were very encouraging. I was always a nerd. I loved school and school loved me. Nursing, or <laughs> learning was my jam. It simply lit me up and everyone could tell. Mom was tickled by the idea that I'd be the first in the family to go to college. I remember discussing it with her in middle school. And we united in our goal, getting me into a good college. By the end of eighth grade, my mom had convinced my father to pay tuition for me to attend a higher performing high school. Once there, we did everything from extra reading retention classes to SAT tutoring to help me prepare. I was excited. So were my parents. They bragged about my plans with family and friends. In the summer between junior and senior year, my father and I took legendary father-daughter tours of college campuses. Those were good times, long car rides, singing Billy Joel songs together on the radio and talking about big dreams. College was an investment. And I was nervous because money had a tendency to blow up. Even though we all struggled with the financial famine in between big government checks, it seemed like dad wrestled with it the most. His way of coping was to buy himself a hard-earned toy when they hit pay dirt. And by toy, I mean a sports car or a private airplane or a boondoggle in Atlantic City. Unfortunately, those treats often came at the expense of food security, taxes, mortgage payments, and savings. But in this case, he managed to put the tuition funds in reserve my father showed me the passbook savings account with the entire amount for school. As a family, we were in sync, mentally, emotionally, and financially, we were ready. I couldn't wait to soak up life as a fine arts major at UC and paint and draw my way through life. And then one Saturday morning, the summer before college was to start, my father invited me to our slip at the marina to see our new yacht. Before leaving the house, I saw what I hoped to be a college acceptance letter. Excitedly, I brought it with me to open with dad. When I showed my father, he gave me a sheepish grin. Then with an aw shucks shrug of his shoulders, he said, we can't afford to send you to school anymore. What? Wait, what? On a whim, my parents had bought this yacht with my college fund. That's right, my parents blew my college fund on a yacht. Painted on the side was its name, another toy. I was gobsmacked. As I stood there, the dock and the boats around me blurred and reality drifted out of reach. In my disbelief, my childhood flashed before me. 
This was shocking, but not out of character. Somehow it added up. Hope, certainty, optimism drained from my body. The dreams of the friends I'd make and the stuff I'd learn was now a memory. So was my family's shared goal and my trust. I was alone. <clears throat> Fast forward. This is from chapter 11, which is called Write the Eulogy. Defining what it means to talk about money is different for everyone. Giving yourself permission to be rich or negotiating for a raise might be examples of this. Other examples might include discussing problematic credit card spending, getting straight answers to vexing financial problems, connecting the dots from past experiences to present day, sharing a never before spoken secret or a million other things. For me, talking about money meant distinguishing between the things that my parents did with their money, shrouded in secrecy and the impact that their poor financial choices had on me. After 30 years of silence and shame, I debated in my mind whether the one story I'd never told a living soul was even mine to tell. The financial fiasco where my parents blew my college fund on a yacht. I worried it might be too personal or disloyal to let anyone outside of my family know it. After many restless nights, I finally came to the conclusion that anything that happened to me also belonged to me, that my experiences were mine to tell if I chose to. Despite the fact that I, only, that I not only talked with people about their money for a living, and guided them on their paths to wealth, my professional focus never translated to my being able to talk openly about my feelings about my money. And while I was good with money, even vigilant in living a good life, I wasn't living my best life. And while I was doing well, I wasn't realizing my full financial potential yet. Researchers from a group called Nonfiction found that when it comes to talking about money, people prefer to share financial optics over feelings and real numbers. It's easy to talk about things that reflect a fun lifestyle or are otherwise visible to other people, such as big purchases, how much their houses are worth, or vacation pictures. It's hard to talk about the things that really matter, like what keeps us up at night and why, our relationship with money, past mistakes, or things we don't understand, like the markets, how interest works, or or our feelings. Just thinking about these things, let alone, op let alone talking openly, may make us feel embarrassed, remorseful, inferior, or even incompetent. And yet, it's talking about our feelings about money and the actual numbers that are the crucial conversations. Status signaling about big ticket purchases or stock market chatter is shallow small talk. What really counts, pardon the pun, is to make the fine print the large print, by talking about things like our gaps in knowledge, our financial concerns and questions, money relationships with yourself and others, what you think about when you think about money, your dreams, behaviors, mistakes, regrets, fears, and of course, the actual money, what you make, keep, and invest. It was changing my mind that money is not private and opening my mouth to talk about it that completely changed my life. It's often the case that talking about money is what opens things up for people. The most cathartic money conversation of my life so far happened when I shared the truth about my college finances. That's right, sharing the story of the yacht debacle is what changed my life. <clears throat> Move over silent yoga retreat, hand me a microphone is what I say these days. <laughs> In 2019, I signed up for a public speaking class to brush up on my skills. Shortly after enrolling, a voice inside started whispering, it's time to tell your story. I knew which story the voice meant and was not jumping for joy to tell it. To tell my story meant that I was first going to have to change my mind and make it okay to talk about money. money. No gracias, I was fine. But the voice kept nudging me. It's time to tell your story. Slowly, the idea took hold. I wasn't sure that there'd be a chance to share it during my course, but wrote a few lines down just in case and promised myself I would if there was an opportunity. 
And because the universe had my back, at the very end of the day, we were all asked to deliver a two minute talk about any story from our lives that we wanted. Everyone else used their time to talk about light topics like puppies and sandwiches, whereas I was about to deliver a bombshell of vulnerability. With a bad case of stage fright, racing pulse, pounding heart, nearly irresistible urge to flee, I barely kept it together as I walked the audience through the humiliation of the yacht debacle. Speaking the words out loud made me realize I had never allowed myself to process my trauma or to grieve over the shame and betrayal I had felt. With the emotional liberation I experienced, I realized I hadn't told a story at all. I had delivered a long overdue eulogy for the part of me that had died on the marina dock. For decades, I lived under the storm of shame, believing that if my parents didn't think I was worth investing in, then I must not be worth very much. Talking about money helped me know an inner peace I never knew existed or that I even needed, and that healed my soul in a way that success or money never would. No more withholding the tender parts of me from friends and loved ones, no more shame or self-sabotage, no more feelings of unworthiness, no more secrets. The quality of my life is increased exponentially because my self-worth has increased. I don't hide my imperfections as much anymore because I accept myself for who and what I am. And although there is nothing that I could say about money growing up, I've succeeded in creating the opposite experience for my sons. They know that there is nothing that they cannot say about it. Yay. I love the way you chose those two excerpts. That was so smart. Thank you. Oh. I mean, you've told, talked about this story for a long time, but it's just that opening story is awesome. The setup, the build, we fall in love with your parents. And so it's just devastating in the way it needs to be because it was devastating to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good, really good choices there. Really good writerly choices there. Thank you. And you shared the eulogy piece, which is interesting and talked about the no more secrets because mm -hmm. I actually... I had this line I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's from the introduction. It's you said um, a real challenge in our relationship with money isn't juggling work and school or even finances. This is the part. It's ruminating in isolation on the shock and shame of our financial stories or choices. And I highlighted that because uh, that's... I mean, um, to me, that's the heart of what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's talk about, you know, why this was so important for you to write this book about mm -hmm. money, because you're an expert on so many different aspects of our financial lives. Why this book? Well, I think there were two things, three things. One, I... I get serious about writing this book after I shared my own story because it was, um, as I said, I, I was, I'm, I was happy then I'm happy now. I'm a happy person living a great life. Um, but what I didn't realize I didn't have was that sense of inner peace. Like I never knew that was missing from my life. And it was really letting this um, secret go that liberated me from just this cloud that I never knew existed. And what I can say about, you know, my reaction on the dock was really, it was all defense mechanism, right? I went inward, I became um, extremely independent and would not rely on other people as a result of what had happened, which was the right, those were the right choices to make for the time to get me up and out and going. However, um, I used very natural defense mechanisms on a long-term basis and that really meant for short term. And that's what I had to unwind. And I think the thing that we don't really, it's not only that we don't talk about it enough, it, the fact that we don't talk about it enough 
we don't even realize that we're operating under what I call a secrecy bias. Just about all of us have been taught talking about money is taboo. It's something like, you know, 77, 80% of people think it's rude, it's taboo, you know, fill in your own blank. And being a financial advisor practitioner now for almost 25 years, I think it is the bias single-handedly that holds people back the most from realizing their full financial potential. What happens when we start getting more comfortable talking about money? What are some things that you've seen happen with people that um, have learned from you and took and started to be open, more open? This is a really crazy story, but um, I, I have a client who works for a major luxury brand, and I had several other clients who also work for the same brand, but in different divisions. Mm-hmm. And each division at this company, actually, um, some have pensions and some don't. And I just made this assumption that the division that she was in had a pension. So she knew that she didn't. And she knew that other colleagues of hers did. And because we had that conversation, I didn't tell her go to HR and ask for a pension. But the fact we had the conversation, the next time I met with her, she went to HR and actually negotiated and they gave her the same, they allowed her into another division's pension. And that came from this com- this conversation that we that we had. So she just somehow that gave her the idea, and she ran with it. And she'll have a life, you know, a lifetime source of income when she's sixty five years old. That I don't think that would have happened if we didn't have that conversation. I mean, and you know, you and I pull I pulled that quote together about shame, shock and shame, and I think. I mean, no one can be in this planet and not have some shame or shock around money at some point. And why do you think we are so afraid to talk about it? I know you said secrecy bias, but like if it's a shameful thing, why is it worse than almost anything? (laughs) You know, know what? I I actually, I'm a very big uh, fan of Brene Brown. Sorry, I was mixing my uh, Brene and fan. Um, and I actually want to ask her the question, like, is all shame created equal? Because money shame takes the cake. And I'm like, that's got to be a different level. I think it's really, um, I think we're just trained. Like, no, like the answer to talking about money is no, like we don't do that. And if you do, that makes you a certain type of person you're gauche, you're rude, you are fill in the blank. And I I think that really works on us. And I also think, um, you know, like that fear of what other people are going to think about us if we talk about it, whether it's a mistake that we made or some attitude that we hold, or even if it's an ambition that we have, I, I really think part of the shame is that we so deeply fear being judged by other people. Mm-hmm. Whether we it's judge people harshly though about money mistakes, you know. Yeah, we do. Yeah, and mm-hmm. we judge people for not having it, and we judge people for having it. I was just gonna say, you can't win for losing, right? If you, if you don't if you don't have it, you're judged one way. If you, uh, you know, if you do have it, like I think the only two guys on the planet that have money that people like are Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, because for some somehow some way like because they're giving all their money away, right? So they, they're just perceived differently than other people who, like even we have nuances of if you've earned the money versus inherited the money, we've completely set, you know, a different set of eyes for people who have the same net worth, but the way you come into your money has a lot to do with it. it it's, it's really complicated. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into our, you know, our money self is what I call it. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's a deep, a deep topic. So I wanted to ask you, you know, you shared, you talked about the eulogy, you share really deeply personal stories in the book. What, as a writer, what was that process like for you to allow yourself? It's one thing to stand up in a room with maybe, if you know, 50 people. It's another thing to put it in a book for total strangers that you'll never meet to read. And, you know, with, with, you know, and I hope thousands and thousands of people reading that. So how how was that process like for you to put it on the page and let it go? 
I think for me, because I publicly spoke the words and, you know, the, what I shared earlier about the money eulogy, um, I'm not kidding. I was, um, I, I, I actually thought I might be having a heart attack when I, right before I was going to tell that story. And, um, I think once I did tell the story, you know, and I've had some other situations too. It's not just telling a money secret, but I've had other, like, I, um, I've been intimidated by someone I'm being introduced to who's, you know, really big muckety muck, or, uh, I'm a financial advisor. You know, a large part of my early career was spent cold calling other human beings. Like that is nerve wracking. So I put myself in situations during my whole career where I had to stretch out of my comfort zone as an introvert because I, I, my, the thing that I was trying to accomplish was bigger than how I felt in the moment. And I would kind of say the same thing here that, um, first of all, there pretty much ain't nothing worse that's going to happen to me than my parents blowing my college fund on a yacht and me having to deal with those feelings and then eventually overcoming the shame. So not exactly a piece of cake to put it all on paper, but all the healing had been done and all the nerves that I needed to gather, I I already had them. So I yeah. Awesome. Well, I wanna I want I have more questions, but I want to I want you to read another excerpt. Everybody, please, if you don't have a copy of Be Good with Money, we hope you'll pick one up uh today. And, or maybe you need more than one by now. Maybe you thought, oh, I have a short list of people who need this. Uh, so we hope that you'll, you'll pick, pick them up. And I want to, I do want to say that you have, if you're in the tri-state, uh, that you have an event coming up, right? June, yeah. June 5th. June 5th. In yep. Markoff, New Jersey. What's the name of the bookstore? Dear Reader Bookstore. Dear Reader. It's a great Dear name Reader. for. So cute. Great it's name. So cute. Um, so you can come on by, I'm actually gonna come on by myself and visit dear reader and, and celebrate Michelle, but we hope that you will pick up a copy today and we hope you will leave a review today. Okay. Let's set up the next excerpt. Sure. Before we do, I'm going to sidebar and just say, um, it is you AJ who has taught me slash reminded me that, uh, I make it a practice of leaving people reviews on their book. I never used to do that before I met you. Um, I just didn't know what I didn't know of how important that is to do. And I also didn't think about my independent bookstores enough. And you really have me thinking about that too, which was um, just a super cool coincidence that Dear Reader and Wyckoff literally just opened their doors three weeks ago. And that just felt like divine timing, considering my book was coming out, that I could host an event with a brand new bookstore and bring people to them in an independent bookstore as my book was launching. So it was awesome. Oh, that fills my heart with joy. Independent bookstores, everybody. We're giving you links to Amazon, but it, you know, I'm all you can go go to your local bookstore. Uh, all most independent bookstores now actually have their own online shops that are usually um, facilitated by bookshop.org. Uh, so there's no, you can absolutely do it. It's easy peasy. It doesn't have to be complicated. All right, Michelle, let's okay. set up this excerpt. Okay. So this is from chapter two, uh, which is called secrecy bias. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read a couple of excerpts um, about what secrecy costs. In my observation, secrecy is the bias that has the biggest failure rate when it comes to money. The secrecy bias acts like cloud cover, blocking the rays of the sun from shining on our skin's receptors and creating strength building vitamin D. The ability to reason cannot develop when we're cut off from talking to others. In our silence, we become trapped with our distorted understanding losing out on perspectives that would help us to see a bigger picture or take a longer view. Without opportunities to speak openly about money, we give away all of our powers of independence, critical thinking, control, and ultimately choice. Money secrets in childhood, i.e. your parents never talked about money in front of others or financial information was intentionally withheld from members of your family 
have damaging side effects in adulthood and can lead to overspending or perpetual lack of trust and excessive worry about money. Money secrets in families are especially damaging to women. When women are not raised in a home where transparency about money is valued, they are more likely to settle for lower salaries and are less confident negotiating in the workplace. In secrecy and silence, we don't get to learn from experts or others who have had experiences similar to our own. Without an outside vantage point, we may downplay or catastrophize situations and be unable to keep ourselves from digging deeper into a hole. Secrecy bias creates a negative framing around talking about money, leading us to erroneously believe that there's more to lose than gain by being open about our money situation. On the other hand, by sharing, reasoning, and questioning our money relationships, we learn about ourselves and others. When we share, we gain compassion, respect, perspective, and fresh ideas. These outcomes of sharing can create a sense of hope and renewed optimism, something, we're de something we desperately crave when we're worried about our financial future. Empathy is often the result of a meaningful conversation, especially when the listener is committed to understanding the other person's perspective. Secrets, unwanted behaviors, and financial precarity are forms of suffering. Being understood opens the door to grace for yourself and for your journey. There's magic in being witnessed. Whether we end up fooling ourselves into thinking that things are better than they are, or whether we become shame-filled and afraid that others will judge us harshly if they know our truth, we are missing the very available opportunity to improve our situation and build financial stability. It simply takes an outside perspective and accountability to change our financial situation. Both of those require us to discuss our financial situation and habits openly with others. The burden of carrying secrets extend beyond mental stress and loneliness to unstable finances, avoidable losses, legal and tax issues, even regret. Withholding financial information erodes trust in both personal and professional relationships and are contributing factors and outcomes like divorce, job denial, and employment termination. The stakes of keeping financial secrets and an inability to cope with financial problems could not be higher as the ultimate price can be loss of life itself. According to the World Health Organization, many suicides happen impulsively in moments of crisis with a breakdown in the ability to deal with life stresses, such as financial problems, relationship breakups, or chronic pain and illness. A 2001 Pew Research Center report highlights that concerns over financial security and personal health are closely linked to heightened psychological distress potentially leading to severe outcomes like suicidal thoughts or actions. The combination of secrecy, isolation, and lack of support may create a perilous cycle that magnifies the psychological toll of financial burdens. Meanwhile, open communication and robust support systems mitigate financial stress. <clears throat> Andrew was raised by his grandparents and most of his ideas about being good with money came from emulating them. As a child, he'd sit in a club chair in his grandfather's study, warmed by a crackling fire, reviewing stock prices in the newspaper and tracking them on a large portfolio ledger. Andrew lovingly recalls an old world English aristocrat smoking jacket vibe as he learned about earnings and savings, the compound effects of investing and not being too showy with what you have. His grandparents were for the, from the greatest generation and excellent mentors of fiscal responsibility, prudence, and self-control. Upon their passing, Andrew inherited a life-changing amount of money. He cherished the fact that the two most significant people in his life entrusted him with such a substantial amount of money, but he struggled to feel worthy of receiving this windfall. For a long time, he internalized the pressure while doing his best to measure up to their belief in his ability to manage and preserve it. He felt like the inheritance was their money, not his. Andrew continued to live on the shoestring he was used to living on. He agonized over every financial detail and kept tight control of his spending, limiting himself to only bare necessities. No one in real life, including me, told him to live like that. 
he conducted himself in a way that mirrored his perception of his grandparents' expectations. And that worked for Andrew for the first 18 months. Then suddenly the pendulum swung in the other direction. Andrew rebelled, said yes to virtually everything his family wanted, and began spending six times his monthly budget. In advance of receiving the second and final installment of his inheritance, he knew he needed to be more responsible. At my request, and after a lot of initial resistance, we were able to take an honest look at his expenses. The news was sobering. At his current rate of spending, we confirmed that his money would run out before his daughter reached middle school. So we recalibrated. We spent weeks poring over Excel spreadsheets, detailing every penny he'd spent. Together, we created a new spending plan and he agreed to a monthly account withdrawal to meet expenses while leaving the remaining investment portfolio alone to grow future security. A few weeks into his new plan, Andrew came back to my office and shared he'd been spending much more money each month than he had disclosed. He was regularly running up his credit cards to high balances and then taking large chunks of money out of his inheritance to pay them off. The withdrawals were large enough, 30K a month, to render a financial plan moot. Everything needed to be redone. He apologized repeatedly for wasting my time, taking the complete blame and speaking of himself in the harshest terms. It was painful to hear him attack his own character when he told me about his omission. It was only after the burden of his secret became too much, when he simply had to face his perceived risk that I might be too angry or frustrated to continue working with him, that he opened up and told me the truth. Opening up to me about his true debt took a lot of courage, especially since he judged himself so harshly. What a lonely place for him to have been, alone with his, with his thoughts, void of empathy or perspective. Feeling isolated with your money troubles is not healthy. First of all, it feels terrible. Without a sounding board, it's very common to sink into feelings of shame, guilt, dread, and doom. When these feelings go unchallenged, they run rampant, unchecked until things feel so desperate that we are finally willing to ask for help. This usually happens after our financial situation has taken a hit. And then there's an even bigger mess to clean up. Like many people, Andrew's silence, secrecy, and shame could have bankrupt and ruined him financially. For many people, it does. At the root of any financial problem is a sneaky suspect, secrecy. Secrecy is one of the most direct paths to unbalancing our emotional drivers, which leads to financial self-sabotage in all its forms. When we struggle with money, we can catastrophize a spillover failure effect which can in turn tighten the vice grip of secrecy and cause a spiral. I'm a staunch proponent of the idea how you do one thing is not how you do everything. However, I do see too often, however, what I, what I see too often is that people don't pause long enough to realize I'm a success at large, but I struggle in this one area, money. If you're successful in other parts of your life, you can be successful with money too. Overcoming financial self-sabotage takes some understanding and grace. My dear friend and psychologist Howard Farkas captured Andrew's dilemma. The financial self-sabotage is conflicting values and competing commitments based on the duality of the human need to belong and the human need for autonomy. In other words, if I do too much of my own thing by spending freely on the things I want, then relationships suffer. On the other hand, if I go along with what others need or want, like Andrew, by putting the financial needs of others ahead of my own, then I lose myself. Too much freedom can lead to isolation because we alienate others. Too much belonging can lead to over-prioritizing others and self-sacrificing. Hmm. I get emotional there because you brought up Howard. Yeah. Yeah. Howard Farkas, wonderful, dear man, brilliant man, um, who was a top three book workshop alum and passed away very suddenly. And many of us loved him a lot. I love that you quoted him there. Yeah. Very um, special person. Taught me a lot in a very short time. Yeah. He would be so, he would be here. He would be here tonight. He would be here. I think yeah. he is here. 
what does it mean? What does it really, you said your title, which is amazing several times, but what does it really mean to be good with money? Hmm. <laughs> you know, actually to be good with money is to have an answer to that question, which is what does it mean to be good with money, which most people don't stop to answer that question. So that's number one, because it comes from within. But being good with money, like the traditional things would be, okay, you're able to earn a living, you're able to save, you're able to invest for your future, you can kind of manage the present bias versus the future you bias, right? All humans, pretty much, we want to do what we want to do in the moment and to hell with tomorrow. You know, we just can't picture that person. Um, to me, I think being good with money means... It's uh, it's a bit of a financial literacy definition, which is the facts and the figures of the conversation, right? The financial literacy part, right? Um, and the ability to speak and communicate not only about what you have, but also about what you think, about what you aspire to, about uh, mistakes you've made, about things that scare you. Um, it's really knowing yourself well when it comes to money. Hmm, I love that. Knowing yourself well when it comes to money. That's a definition I haven't heard before. I love that. Um, I do. We have a little bit of time for a question. So if anybody has a question, you can put it in the chat uh, for Michelle. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you uh, what's been surprising about your author journey. So when you started out, you started out, you wanted, wanted to write the book. Yep. What shocked you? about this process <laughs> okay well this is embarrassing to admit to admit um i had a colleague from my days at um uh merrill lynch who wrote a book and in the introduction of her book she said it took her 10 years to write the book and it's like god's practical joke because i read that and said how does it take someone 10 years to write a book um, so I've been paid back because it took me seven to write this one. Um, so I think that was, uh, that shocked me. Um, I think the, first of all, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a very, like my creativity has always been visual arts, you know, painting, drawing, photography. So writing was not an art form for me in any way, shape or form when I started, so there was a very, very big learning curve. Even though I'm a professional, what I do for a living, I analyze numbers, mainly communicate by verbalizing the conceptual, you know, conceptualizing numbers with words, but verbally. So I think it was the um, the learning curve of finding a voice, learning how to write, um, and then learning, you know, what actually goes into the quote unquote production of a book. Uh, there, I mean, every step was, was a shock and a revelation pretty much. <laughs> every step was a shock and revelation. That right. sounds, that's, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. But I will tell you, I mean, part of the joy of the journey are a lot of the people who are sitting here in this audience who I know and mm -hmm. what I find so amazing. Um, I mean, if you think about what I've shared with my yacht story, and how I, really I used self-isolation and extreme personal independence to get myself through like the next 30 years. And I wasn't really in community a mm -hmm. lot with other people. And writing actually really taught me what a real community is, how to be in one, how to be a giver in one, I don't know the balance of asking and taking too. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably been one of the biggest gifts I've received in the whole process. And it's amazing because so many authors do just write alone, you know, writing in community. The reason I created community for writing sprints, it's such a simple thing. Let's meet on Zoom and write. Um, but it's because, yeah, writing's lonely, all that. But the we are more apt to give up if we don't have people we can see who are also writing, who know what we're doing and care about us. 
um, that's just, that's just a fact. So I'm glad that you've were enriched by that. And of course, so glad that even though your book came out, I saw you on Friday in sprints, you know, that you're, mm -hmm. yeah, that's no, I'm still running. Yes. Yeah, I have no plans to write another book. Like any friend right now who's going to say that to me, I'm warning them. I will never talk to them again if they ever say that again at the moment. Um, but I'm still writing and I'm writing all kinds of ideas that have bubbled up that didn't make it into the book that I just put in a parking lot. And now I'm just writing essays and it's going to create something. We'll see. It will for sure. Also, I've heard that song before, by the way. I'm never writing another book. Just saying. I, I'm just holding it like where <laughs> it is right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, Edie wants to know, what differences have you found between genders and finance that surprised you or shifted your perspective? Hmm. Um, I actually find that men actually like to talk about their money a little bit more than women do. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. They uh, seem, believe it or not, they seem to open up a little bit more. They, they seem to open up faster. They both will, both genders will, but yeah, guys have kind of surprised me. Hmm. All right. Women need to speak up as usual. Speak up. <laughs> um, Richard says, uh, Oh, Richard wants to know the big question. I think a bunch of people are really wanting to know. Okay, what? He's such a gentleman. So, of course, Richard says you don't have to answer this. It's very Richard. Okay. Um, I'm really curious. Were your parents ever able to redeem themselves? Oh, I should. You know, I do get asked. I get asked um, that. I get asked, did you ever go on the boat? I get asked, oh. what made you think you were entitled to their money? Um, I don't know. Yes. They told you constantly, showed you a passbook. I don't know. Um, the honest answer is my parents never redeemed themselves. They never apologized. Um, they never owned it. You know any of those things. Um, and actually, I had to expand my definition of what forgiveness meant. It took me a long time to get there. And it was actually the journey of studying behavioral biases we have in financial therapy that I finally could look at things from their perspective and just have compassion for what they did know and what they didn't know. And it was a different era too. I mean, think about like, there's so many things we talk about today that I mean, so many things were taboo, not just money. So they grew up in that era. And um, I know, listen, I, as I say in the book, my parents were a power couple. They just were not powerful with their money. They were not bad people. They were not evil. They just were a mess with their money. And they couldn't, you know, they had all the ingredients. I think as a kid, I was very aware of our finances, unfortunately, at, you know, age, inappropriate ages. Um, but I always saw my parents at their highest and best. And I always saw that they had all the raw ingredients to really get it together when it came to their money. And they just couldn't. Um, and it actually is what drove me to go into the work that I do that, I literally, part of why I wrote this book, why I'm a financial advisor is that um, there's a very young part of me that wants to give to other people what I was not able to help and give to my parents. Hmm. We got a couple more questions. I'm going to do Richard's follow-up first. <laughs> Did they ever find out that you forgave them? Yes. Okay, good. Then Darcy's afraid you won't be her friend anymore because she's asked. Don't say it, Darcy. Don't okay. do it. Okay. Well, I'm not going to say it. I'll leave it out. You can read the chat if you I want. read the chat. You're in big okay. trouble, Darcy. Just, just, she's, okay, you're in trouble, Darcy. Um, <clears throat> before we, I have one, really, the question, my favorite question. Joey's always dying laughing right now. My favorite question I always ask, I'm going to ask you in a moment. I want to remind everybody, please pick up a copy. If you haven't, give it as a gift. Please leave Amazon reviews a thousand times. I'm 
It's so important. And getting one review is like sometimes takes, it's like a superhuman effort. Um, but before I do that, I want to mention to everybody, our last Monday night reading of this season, we're going to take a two month, we always take a hiatus over the summer. Our last one of this season is Monday, June 3rd, and that's Sarah Thurber and Blair Miller, alums of Top Three Book Workshop, who they will be reading from their book, Good Team, Bad Team. So we're excited about that. Uh, okay. The question I always love to ask, we're going to close the night with it. What is the change you want to see in this, in the world because your book now exists? Just one. I just want people, well, uh, two. <clears throat> what I'm actually really talking about in this book is sort of a one-sided conversation about money, right? This is a book to help a person really get to know who they are, what their money relationship is. That in and of itself gives a person so much power to be able to step into hard conversations. What I want is for people to be able to navigate the financial plot twists that inevitably are going to come up that the way through managing those plot twists are actually talking about them. Awesome. I want people to talk about their money. You want people to talk about their money. It's great. Um, we really appreciate you all showing up for Michelle tonight um, for this wonderful rite of passage. We're so proud of you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining tonight so much. And thank you for having me, AJ. Of course, of course. Again, Michelle, you have committed to excellence at every step. You did not give up no matter what. You did not settle for that's good enough at any stage in the process and in shows. We're so proud of you. Everybody, thank you so much. Um, oh, wait, before we leave, Denise wants to know, how can I help promote the event in Wyckoff? Oh. You have, how can, is there a way? Yeah. Um. You know what, Denise, if you'll put your email or phone number in the chat, I'll hook up with you. But um, the best way, I um, I guess, is to just tell your friends and come on to the party like it's an open house and jump on some social media. Okay, grab that email quick. Okay. You got it? Oh, Laura's got it for you. Laura's always got okay. your back. Laura's got it. No, don't sweat it, Michelle. What am, I, what am I thinking? I know. She's always got everybody's back. All right, everybody. Another lovely Monday night. Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you on June 5th. You, everybody. And I'll see you in sprints. Have Bye a good then. night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>